Thanks everyone of the few select that actually have shown up and interestingly enough we have more physical presence than uh, online but thanks Angus for actually being our online audience. Um, <laughs> once again we are in person as well and have proper meetings again and tonight we're going to have Lawrence talking about WebSockets. So yes okay so what um to, to recap what are web sockets, I'll start with kind of a recap of the history of the web. So I've got a diagram here. And so we've got big blue button, we've got my little diagram. Uh, just to, to give you some history of how web sockets fits into the web. So in the beginning, we have web servers and web browsers. And very soon people got tired of static web pages. And so there are things that can plug in on this side, which will do general. Uh, dynamically generated content, not just web pages, but anything that the browser will understand, like for example, images and audio and stuff, uh, going, going through from the web server through to the web browser. Um, but even that wasn't enough. People wanted to do dynamic stuff on the web browser side as well. And so JavaScript was invented. And together with JavaScript, there's a thing called dynamic HTML. Dynamic HTML allows the JavaScript to actually uh, dynamically modify the web page and change bits of it without having to reload the whole thing. Uh, notice those stripe lines, uh, those are the security boundaries. So those are areas that you've got to watch out for. Remember that the web browser is there to protect the user. So this JavaScript comes from the web server. So it, it keeps it at arm's length, it keeps it in a little box to tightly control what it can do. But there is a pipe through there so it can communicate back to the server. And then the server, of course, doesn't know what's coming back. It has to do its own validation to make sure that uh, things are properly all right there. So um, in addition to being able to initiate requests, there was a feature that added by Microsoft called XML HTTP requests, uh, which was done later. Oh, wait, I'll, I'll come to that. So. On the, on the server side, different languages plug in in different ways. Um, at the beginning, there was CGI bin, which some of you, you early web development may have heard of. CGI bin basically means the web server can run any executable on the server side and feed it any command. That's generally considered inefficient and clunky these days because every CGI bin request involves creating a process to run a program on the server side. So what was done instead, you have modules that plug into the web server like modphp, use PHP, so PHP executes within the web server, within worker processes that the web server manages. And there's a corresponding mod Python as well that also um, runs in there. But that's not really much used that much nowadays. Instead, what happened was the Python community created something called WSGI, Whiskey. So what happens is instead of a mod Python in the web server, you have mod Whiskey. And what mod WSGI does, it defines a very simple, very basic protocol uh, where you have a Python mainline and that can get requests and respond and all that kind of thing uh, to that. Uh, so that was kind of done in parallel with, with things coming on. So in addition to dynamic HTML on the JavaScript side, the, the thing with XML HTTP request is that it requires a new request for every bit of data that you get back from the server. So this one um, opens a new connection to there. It's basically like a, a page request within a page request. So as far as the server is concerned, it looks just like a page request. So initiate, get some data back, and then the JavaScript plugs that data into the existing page without, uh, without uh, refreshing the whole thing. So then it was thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could have something that looks like a raw TCP socket between the JavaScript and the server. So that's what WebSockets is. So with WebSockets, you open a, the JavaScript can open a connection back to a special server, not the web server, but a different port, an entirely different server. And then it can do any number of packets in this direction, and that server can send any number of packets back in an ongoing transaction that can stay live. And that can be text packets, it can be binary packets. Uh, so they can do whatever you like. 
So the, the Python folks also wanted to be able to do this kind of thing. So the way they did it was instead of this WSGI thing, which was only for the web, they came up with a new thing called ASGI or ASG. This is, so this is the web server gateway interface. So they replaced it with the asynchronous asynchronous server interface. Um, as you may know, in Python 3.5, they added async await uh, with an event loop. So ASGI plugs very much into that event loop so that your single Python program can handle basically multi-threaded, but not really multi-threaded because it's not preemptive, but it can handle multiple concurrent requests and run an event loop and block one. So one, one request is being blocked waiting for something, another one can run and all that kind of thing. So ASCII handles both. So this is like a, a, a custom. So you've got a, a web server in ASCII and I'll, I'll show you. So yeah, I'll show you in a minute how I use that particular example. So in here, this is my example little uh, program. I'll open my uh, ping server ASCII. So this is what, so this one, uh, has to run within a, so, so this is what the main line looks like. So you see this, uh, this is a service name. So the service name is called ping and the module name is taken from the file name. So the module name is ping server ascii.py. And so you've got to run an ascii server and the one I'm using is uvicon. There are a few others. So I tell it what port to listen on because my JavaScript code is expecting port 9370. So let's, um, let's turn on full logging. So I have an environment variable. If I look here in my code, uh, I can examine this variable if it's defined and then I can use it to set the logging module. Has anybody else used the Python logging module? I'm still kind of new to it, but um, the good thing is because normally I do a lot of standard error, right? So standard error, right? And all that kind of thing. And then if you want to control the logging, then you got maybe you go through and take them all out or do if, if something. The thing with the logging module is that it handles all those kinds of things automatically. So you can just unconditionally write logging messages. And then the ones that don't match the current logging level just get quietly thrown away. So you can leave the code in there. It doesn't hurt anything. Uh, so I set my environment, environment variable, and then I give it the I give it the module name and the service to call, and you see it will search the path and it will find the module called that, which is this file here, and it will load it. So now it started running. See, so it's invoked my main line now. I get three arguments. So every time a new connection is initiated, I get this scope, which is a dictionary. So for example, if I want to authenticate my connection, I'll get the cookies. Uh, so your web page might do a login and you have a session to authenticate. And then the, the WebSocket server will also get those same cookies. And you can check to see if this user logged in. Otherwise, you don't want to allow them to do things on there. And then the receive and send are callback coroutines. That's how you communicate over the connection. Uh, one thing is you get different types of things. So there's a thing, there are lifespan connections for, if you want to optimize across multiple connections, you can manage lifespan state. So all you got, all I do is say, raise an exception if I get anything other than a WebSocket type. And then UVCon will pick that up and will say, see, lifespan protocol appears unsupported. So that says, I don't want to care about lifespan events. And it, it picks up the exception and it quietly stops sending me those events. So very simple, but don't worry about that. So this message hasn't printed out anything yet because there's been no connection. So, whoops, um, what I'll do, I'll run this in the background, ping page HTML. I'll show you the page. I think I should show you the page first. So this is my HTML page. And uh, so this is what the page looks like. So there's an input field into which I can type an address. Th this example was inspired, by the way, um, by 
when uh, Roger showed us PF Sense last time, and uh, I was doing some work on it for him. And um, that one has a lot of nice functions in it, but it's diagnostics. For example, it has a ping function. If you want to do a ping through the web interface, you click the start ping button, and then nothing happens, and then you wait for 10 seconds, and you click stop ping, and then all the ping things come out in there, which I thought was a bit, uh, you know, not as interesting. Because, you know, if you do a ping interactively, every ping that comes back, immediately, you see a response in there. So I thought, why can't you do that through a web page? And with web sockets, you can. So what I do here, I'll show you. So I'll put in 8.8.8.8. Oops. 8.8.8.8. And if I do ping, I've set the interval to two seconds just to slow it down. And as you can see, it is updating the page in real time. You know, and if I come uh, here. So you do the ping and then wait what's remaining of the two seconds and you do another ping? No, I just give it uh, in the ping command. Oh. Um, I can do this here if I, okay, this. So there's my UVCon process running, right? So if I do that again, and then I come here and very quickly, and then, so you see interval two, count of 10. And that's the address. So that's the ping command there. Uh, that's all. So in fact, I, I don't really need to limit the count. I can just leave it ready, but I just left it there just to be safe. Uh, so here's the JavaScript that's working. And you'll notice that um, when I click the ping button, it changes to a stop ping. And then I can stop that, and that, that will kill the process. Come here. And that will, oh, what happened there? Exception, connection closed. Okay, yeah, don't worry about that. That was, yeah. Okay, so I, I didn't actually kill the process. I should have handled that better, but it doesn't matter. So what happened when I did a stop ping was the JavaScript forced closed the connection. And that, of course, that killed the, that stopped the thing. Now, did that stop the ping? Yes, it did stop the ping. So yeah, that's an exercise for the reader if you like, try and handle that a bit more properly. So I'll, I'll show you what's in the HTML. Um, tip to anybody who's in JavaScript. Um, the, there, is, there are horrible parts to JavaScript, and there are some good parts. So this use strict turns off a lot of the horrible parts. Uh, for example, one of the things like by default in JavaScript, if you don't declare a variable, it's automatically declared global when you assign to it. Whereas if you do use strict, that becomes an error. So, you know, var was the original way for declaring variables in JavaScript. Well, I thought that use strict will stop you from using var, but Ian sent me something and he managed to put a var in his. So, but, um, so, you see, yeah, so var, the thing with var is that inside a function, it's, they, it does what they call scope hoisting. That means no matter where you put the var, you might put it inside a for loop or an if statement, the scope is always the function body. Always. Yeah. Uh, but if you put let, so what they did was they put proper things. So let is always within the current block. So always use let instead of var or const. There's another one called const. Yeah, yeah. yeah you saw const. So const means you can't change its value. Yeah, let means it's a variable, so you can. Yeah. So that's what those, so those are the new way of doing things. So, so don't use var anymore. Yeah. So this is, this is just toggling the two buttons. You see? So hide one button, show the other one. So the, just, this is all very basic JavaScript. And then this is again callback. So this is how the thing is, is set up. So you notice that the, the WebSocket URL has all the usual parts for URL. Notice that the protocol can either be WS or WSS. So WSS is TLS encrypted connection. WS is not, because this is a simple local loopback thing on things. I'm just using an unencrypted connection. And you've got the, the host name or address and the port number, and you can have a path, and you can have a query. My, my server-side code is ignoring all this. And you see this, this is called a sub-protocol. So you can use this to identify your particular protocol. And you can pass a list of protocols. 
and then the server side um, can respond to that but uh, okay so supported protocol so see this here so so initially I get a connection so the first thing I get is always a connection event right so I check so I can check the connection type this is ASCII so this is part of the ASCII protocol so every ASCII server will do this via Python code so in theory this Python code could be taken unchanged and run under another ASCII server something I don't know there's something called G-Unicorn and I don't know what all so all of these are there so it doesn't have to be Unicorn that was just what I used there so when I get a a connect event so every event is a dictionary so this is how I receive events so I await receive and then that will block and the event loop will run and then that's an event I get that back so down here you will see that the first thing I did was I got a connection and this is the scope and as you can see it got it's got all the headers and stuff in there and if there were any cookies and also the sub protocols see that's in there that's in there so the first thing I get is a connection scope the first thing is this coroutine gets called with the connection scope and then the first thing that happens is it gets the open event so there's actually two parts to a connection so after this starts running yeah, I get an event and then what I do is I make sure that the protocol is what I match and then uh, so there are these standard codes, protocol codes, uh, that are defined in the WebSockets protocol. So 1000 for a normal status, protocol error. And uh, so unexpected error. So I define a code for that. So I call it weird technical failure for code 1011. So yes, uh, so I use that as the process. I'll, I'll show you afterwards. Um, I'll kill the ping process while it's not expecting it and then it'll return that error. See, something happens. So it can return a protocol error if it doesn't understand the protocol. And then after that, you can, after that, which end happens first, receive or send, that's entirely up to you, right? So the connection is fully full duplex, fully bidirectional. So you can have the JavaScript end wait first or it can send first, that's entirely up to you. So in this case, my protocol is wait for a ping request and then send multiple pings until there's no more responses and then close the connection. So I wait for that. So that's what happens here. And uh, the address or name or address to be pinged is sent by a text rather than binary. So in a, in a WebSockets packet, you can send either text or binary data. Binary is a little bit tricky, to, but there's also, remember, there's built-in JSON in JavaScript. So you can encode arbitrary data as a JSON thing and pass that and then decode it as JSON the other end. So that's probably the way. So when, when you write async IO code, you try and make everything non-blocking as far as possible. And this call, there is no non-blocking version of it. So this will block the entire current thread. This is your conventional get host by name. So this has, you know, if you pass it a name like google.com, then in principle, it will, it will block connecting to the name server. Let's see whether this works. Yeah, it works. So you see it's resolved to an address. So in, in principle, that actually blocked on that line until if there was multiple concurrent requests and the others would, would read. If that was slow, if your name server was slow, then there could be. But uh, there's no easy way currently to do like a, a wait get host by name. There's no equivalent to that yet. No async IO version yet. Probably in a future version of Python, there will be. It could very well do, yeah. So if the DNS is unreachable, it could very well hang there. And that will block all your requests if you're having, you know, 10 multiple concurrent requests on there because they're all running on the same event. Yes. Or something with two dots in it. Ah, that's an interesting one because that actually returns, that actually returns, if you look at that one, yeah, that was one of the first things I tried at by accident. But given that I knew what it was, it, this IDNA thing. So there's something called Punicode or something involving uh, Unicode encoded domain names. I'm not sure. So I managed to trigger that by putting in a completely invalid thing with two dots in it. And so because I saw this happen, I was clever enough to put in a catch on that. That's why that thing has a catch 
for OS error, anything like name not found. Yeah, Google.xyz. Let's try that. Does it exist? Don't know whether Google.xyz. Pinging. So, good question. Yeah. No, I, no, it's resolved it. I think it's resolved it. I'm not sure. Request to ping. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe it hasn't. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's not happening. Yeah. So, yes, I didn't get any address for that. Yeah. Error translating target, GAI error. So, GAI error, I think that's a subclass of OS error. So, I did, I did get that back. Let me try that again. Do I get GAI error? See this, see this error here? So this is what you normally get from socket host by name if it can't resolve. But you'll notice that I haven't seen it here yet. Ah, it finally came back, finally timed out. Yeah, code 1003. So what is 1003? Uh, so I call that data error. So something was wrong with the data that you sent me. I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it, so that's okay. So um, here, Instead of the normal subprocess module, AsyncIO has its own special subprocess facilities so that it can manage it using the task management facility. So it looks very much the same like a subprocess call, um, but it returns uh, this async, yeah, it returns an object that can do things here. So now, so this is the loop that waits for all the ping results to come back. And uh, now, I did one thing here, which I later realized was really unnecessary. While I'm waiting, two things might happen. Either I get a line of output back, or the child process terminates. Because I don't actually assume I'm going to get 10 lines. You know, I told it to ping 10 times, but I'm not assuming that I'll get 10 lines, or whatever I get. So I want to wait for either next line of child done. Now, see what these things here. This is a coroutine. This does not actually read the next line. You know, so all this does is return a coroutine object, which when I await it, then it will return the next line. And similarly, waiting for the, again, this is another coroutine call. So this does not actually wait for the call to complete. The, the reason why I'm wrapping them in this create task is because um, the event async IO cannot await raw coroutine objects directly, even though it has to wrap them in its old task scheduling system. So that's what this does. So this wraps this in there. So then I have these two tasks, these two things, and then I can I want to wait for whichever one terminates first. So there is a call called asyncio.wait where I can pass it a list of these objects. And I don't want to wait for all of them, I want to wait for the first one. So whichever is first, whichever is first comes back. Now this will return two lists, one completed, one not yet completed tasks. I don't care. I ignore that because I can do my own checks. So if next line is done. So it, if the task is done, it either fail or it return data. So I, first I check to see if there was an exception. There might have been an exception. If there's no exception, then, then I get the actual value result, which is the output. And then uh, I send the result back, which could have been a failure code, but you yeah, send that there. And then I mark that as completed by setting it to none. Then I also check to see if the child process has terminated, check the return code. You know, check to see that it terminated with a normal status rather than something strange, and then I send that status back again. So I'll show you what happens with the other one. So I'm pinging there. This is why I made it slow, so that I can... So if I go kill 2763, point terminated with 1011. So that's how it deals with uh, unexpected status code. So you see, it deals gracefully, it deals gracefully with that. Child terminated unexpectedly. Right. So if the child is done, then no point waiting and so I terminate. So then the child is not done, so I create a new task to wait for the next line of data and go run, 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 run. You know, so uh, what's that? There? Yeah, so this is what happens if I couldn't translate the thing properly. And then once it terminates, uh, yeah, so once it terminates, I break out of there anyway, and then the connection will disconnect. So having done all that, 
I then realized I didn't really want to use ASCII after all. The reason I, I had this, I was under the misconception that to use WebSockets from the Python side, I had to use ASCII. But it turns out, no, that's wrong. So UVCOM is actually a layer on top of uh, a Python web server module and a Python WebSockets module. And if you look at the UVCOM page, it's got two choices for each. Uh, if you look here, what have we got here? HTTP, see this? Set the HTTP protocol implementation. Oops, come back here. So which HTTP protocol implementation to use? So it can use HTTP tools or H11. And then WebSockets implementation, it can use WebSockets or WS Proto. So I actually wrote another version which uses WebSockets directly because I'm not using the web functionality, right? I'm only using the, the WebSockets functionality. So if I reconnect to that and then I terminate it, so I wrote two versions. So the other one I wrote is just a direct using the WebSockets layer. So I thought, why bother with ASCII? I can use it directly. So this is a regular executable. And as you can see, it looks like a regular executable. So mm -hmm. asyncio.run main. Mm -hmm. And this is how you do a main line that directly calls WebSockets. So you create a listener that way. Tell it what address to listen on, just loop back, port number, and it will handle the supported sub protocols for you automatically. So it creates, it opens a listens object, and then you just wait forever in there, sort of there. And then up here, a lot of this code looks very similar. So this gets called back every time a new connection is opened. And for backward compatibility, older versions used to pass a second argument. So to be compatible with or without a second argument, I just pass a uh, a variable positional list and then gets. So again, I've got the logger here, same old logger code. So if I do uh, log level equals full equals 10 dot slash pin server WS, run that. So it prints out all my little debugging messages. And this side works exactly the same. Works exactly the same. So no difference, see? And this is just opening there. And uh, so I'm printing out everything. See, I'm printing out everything that's going and coming back. And WebSocket server, because I've set the global logging, see, it's doing its own debugging. This is not my debugging. This is WebSockets, Python WebSockets, doing its own debugging. So all of that is coming up. And uh, another thing I was going to do is do two at once, just to show that it really is uh, multi-threaded or multi multi-tasking. So I come to here, and there we go, that's running two at once. So there's two connections. And if we look at here, quick, quick, quick. Yeah, see, we have two. They both share the same parent process ID. So there's only one, there's only one server process, but it spawned two children to handle two connections. And they're both being interleaved. Let me try that again. Ping, ping. Oh, what the heck, let's do another one. Uh, Apple.com. So we now got three, and we can see three being interleaved here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Three things all being interleaved. So that's, you know, one event loop, three different threads of control going through. So as one blocks, another one runs, and so on. So this is just to prove that you can do that with, uh, uh, with async IO. So they got closed, they got closed. Uh, let me see what else I wanted to talk about. So I've talked about. In my reading, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the last couple of weeks of that web sockets, I think it said something like having like sixty thousand um, requests would be going on from. All right. Uh, 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 is that a limitation? Where is that a limitation? No, no. It just it was sort of relative. It sort of said, I know, with, with traditional web servers sending out things, you might have twenty thousand, and this was going to have the ability to add sixty thousand. So it could um, uh, spew out a lot more messages. Was that XML HTTP request, perhaps? Is that what they're talking about? Yeah, I don't know. Could be, could be. Up, so, yeah, with XML HTTP requests, because every new connection comes in and has got to go through and all that. Whereas with WebSockets, you make one connection and then you can do a whole lot of packets going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So there's not continual setup and teardown, setup and teardown, you know, going on. But, 
But if you were looking at that web server, what happens when the next person joins the website and doesn't? Well, yeah. Piece of server code, but it'll be handling two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll, yeah. So that one process, because I'm only running one process, right? Yeah, that one process. Mm. So that one is listening, and that one can listen for any number of connections. And yeah, it can handle, you know. So you uh, maybe. users out there all getting it at once. Very, very likely. And then I'll create 20,000 20, pings going on in my, <laughs> my poor little machine there. You know, doing, doing that going on. Uh, so the, this is the diagram. So you can still have a conventional web server up there. And you'll do some kind of backend. Typically, you want to authenticate, you know. So you want to share authentication contacts with your web server. You'll have some backend mechanism for that. You know, in terms of instead of so instead of that, or instead of that, you know. So yeah, if you of course if you have a Python based code, then that makes sense. You might as well handle both at once. So I wasn't doing that. That's why I decided not to bother with that and just go straight to WebSockets only. You know, and have. In fact, there's no web server here. It's just opening the files directly in Firefox. So, so that is does that. Um, Thing. So going with it, so I went over the web page. Ah, one little thing I should explain about uh, page, page, yeah. So one little thing, JavaScript in a web page is not multi-threaded. This is, this is not a browser limitation. This is in the spec. And the reason why I mentioned that, notice here, you know, so we can create a new WebSocket, and then we set up all these callbacks. Now, when does the connection actually start connecting? Does it start immediately here? And the answer is no, it doesn't. What happens is it happens in the background, and it can't happen in the background until this JavaScript function finishes executing. So JavaScript itself has its own event loop, like, like async IO. And uh, so you get, a, you get all the time in the world to create your connection, attach all these things, and then once this function finishes, then it goes away and connects. And then when it connects, you get that callback or anything. So that's another fun thing to, to think about in JavaScript. And uh, the, does anybody else? The wonderful statement continuation rule. You know, semicolons are optional in JavaScript. But it doesn't have a sensible, simple rule like Python has. It's got, it actually ha does have a rule, and this does actually work. And you see, not a semicolon, except in the strings, of course. Not a single terminating semicolon. That is all one statement, and that actually works. So uh, I can't put that on the next line. The continuation rule will break. It'll stop at the return and say that's a complete statement. So that's why that has to be on that line. But funny enough, even though that looks like a complete statement, it won't stop there because it can add the next bit onto it. <laughs> Otherwise, these would be syntax errors. You know, if they were separate statements, but they're not. But they're not. That's interesting. It takes out the comments then and makes it still a valid mm, yeah. statement. Yeah. That's the, with Python's explicit backslash. You aren't allowed comments on that line. Mm. Which is, I suppose, partly because these are block comments, not um, end of line comments. Mm. You know, I miss that. I, I like having block comments. I agree. I don't know why the fashion seems to be even even in C and C plus plus slash slash. Mm -hmm. no, even when you've got this kind of style, people don't like to use it anymore. So there we go. That's my JavaScript coding style. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, so that's that. Now, is there anything else? I need yeah, strict mode, connection URL, sub protocol, and then server side. So I've told you about what the basic structure is. Uh, my custom protocol, uh, and then yeah, direct web sockets, and why I did that. So yeah, so in this case, I prefer the direct web sockets version, uh, but you know. but there are all kinds of ways, all kinds of uh, ways of doing this. So so Python has a a nice modern thing in terms of ASCII that cook, that hooks nicely, takes full advantage of async IO. Which is, uh, as you may know, I think is really the bee's knees, one of the neat features that was added to Python, probably 3.5. So we have web frameworks that can take advantage of it now. I think ASCII was created by the Django developers. That's possible. Yeah. So they are Python's answer to WordPress, I guess. 
you know. Yes. Mm. So they they saw the need for a better framework. They saw async IO. Well, I think async IO was sort of modeled on twisted. Twisted was a big one before, and the Django force. Uh, so all these feeding back into different projects, feeding into each other. Yeah, another another reason why I gave up on Ubicon was uh, that except some of those exceptions, because the exact the exact exceptions that I get from the WebSockets layer depend on which which WebSockets layer I was using. And there was no way I could do that through UVCon without assuming what WebSockets layer I was using. So that's one another reason I gave up on it and used that particular WebSockets layer directly so that I knew what exceptions I was getting and I could catch them and uh, handle unexpected shutdowns and things. So yeah, any questions? Anything that's... Uh, so, yeah. so in your case, you go... Um, what do you, what do you look at, the web page? In the browser. Page, this is the ping page.html. So this is that page, which I'm not bothering to serve up via web server. I'm just opening it directly just yeah, for. Because okay. so, yep. normally, like, if it was going, to, it was the home page, it would be index.html. And the web server would ship that out, and then it is ready to go to make, um, to do, once you push the bar, it will ping it for them. Then you would, yeah, whatever, whatever page, you know, diagnostics page, ping function, DNS lookup function, trace root function, da 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 da, da whatever. The, the web server, it could be a static web server. Could be a static page, yeah. but, but you'll probably want authentication, right? Uh, unless it was an internal web intranet, then you probably don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to have access to that function. Right. So you'll probably want to authenticate that function, and then the WebSockets, the Python side will probably want to validate those cookies as well, just to make sure which functions you're allowed to do. You know, maybe you're not allowed to ping the internet, maybe you're only allowed to ping your local LAN. You know, you're a lowly maintenance technician, you're not the chief network engineer. So you're only allowed to ping local <laughs> pings. You know, or maybe your own departmental, you can't ping anybody else. So whatever, whatever. So this was, you know, I thought this was a nice, something that the server can definitely do that the, that the client cannot. Uh, and which does a nice real live update. And uh, so you can do other fancy stuff like take that data, plot a chart, and do a live display. In fact, Roger showed this on the homepage of PFSense. I think the first thing I saw, which I hadn't seen before, was there was a live chart or some kind of traffic. Remember? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I hadn't seen that before. And I thought, that's got to be WebSockets. You know? So they used it in that part. But previously, the diagnostics pin page, they didn't use it. So that was the part that I thought, oh, I can do better than this. So that's what this. didn't bother because ping probably just only does ten pings and that's it. So it's just a limited mm. amount of time, and the other with the other graphs that's sort of like really continuously. Mm. Well, this is you know I mean if you had infinite pings, this kind of real live update would be useful. And then rather than grow, the JavaScript could chuck away, could keep you know say only the last hundred or something, and then you chuck could away the a nice graph out of that, right? Yes, could indeed. So use the Canvas API. Mm. And the canvas API in, and do and draw things and draw plots and bar charts and have it uh, up there. Minimum, maximum, so the maximum, mm -hmm. minimum, and then the thing goes back and forth nicely mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. And uh, the JavaScript canvas API is actually based on a subset of Cairo graphics mm -hmm. for those. Uh, so the Cairo 2D graphics API. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's all that kind of. All right. All Any more questions? Any questions? Did that, did that get through okay, Angus? Angus, you're my only remote audience. Did you get all of that? He seems to be all right. No, oh, okay. was a yep. Well, I'm just on Angus. No, <laughs> he's virtual. He's online. Yeah, he's online. Oh, so, right. yeah, so in this in notes here. Yeah. Just a big thank you to Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.